All right, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Michael Maloney. I'm the CEO, Chief Executive Officer of AIP. That's the American Institute of Physics. And welcome this evening uh, to the event here in New York City. Welcome to the Fathers of the Internet Fireside Chat. It is so wonderful to see so many old friends and new friends uh, join us this evening for this celebration. And I want to thank uh, also, those folks who are joining us online on YouTube, uh, um, potentially across the globe. So you're also welcome this evening to our special occasion. We have amongst ourselves this evening some quite extraordinary guests, uh, including a Nobel Prize physics, no, a Nobel winner in physics. Um, a, very importantly, some students who have been recipients of AIP scholarship awards former and current government officials, astrophysicists, physicists, computer scientists, and many, many other supporters of science uh, and its contributions to society. You're all extremely welcome here this evening. We also have members of the AIP Board of Directors, leaders of AIP's member societies, and members of the Board of Trustees of AIP Foundation that is co-hosting this evening's event. And speaking of trustees, I want to offer very special thanks to one of our members of the AIP Board, or the AIP Foundation Board of Trustees, that is Sandeep Giri, for his advocacy and support in making this event possible. So thank you so much, Sandeep, for your help. <laughs> Sandeep, in his time, was also a recipient of a scholarship from AIP's uh, Society of Physics Students. And uh, we are so grateful that he has taken time out of his busy schedule to give back to the organization. I also want to thank Google Global Networking and Google Cloud for, for sponsoring this event and being so generous in their hosting uh, this evening in this fantastic space here in New York City at the Chelsea campus. And so please also give a round of applause to Google for their support. So tonight we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the invention of the TCP IP protocol, which underpins the architecture of today's internet. It's the very technology that's making possible our global live stream this evening on YouTube as we speak. And in particular, we're here to celebrate two people uh, who invent the two people who invented TCP IP, that is Drs. Vin Cerf and Bob Kahn. AIP Foundation is proud and very fortunate to call Vince Cerf a member of our Board of Trustees. And I know uh, I've had the chance to get to know Vin very well during his tenure on the board, and we're so grateful for, for all the questions that you ask us. Um, but also, uh, Vint and I actually know each other for well over a decade and um, because we share a passion for space as well, which uh, was the original reason for our coming together. Vince and Bob's contributions to the technology revolution that empowers so much of our economic activity, our scientific and engineering endeavors, uh, and our cultural life is second to none. But you might also be wondering, what has the TCP IP protocol got to do with the mission of AIP, the American Institute of Physics? Well, our goal at AIP and, and with our member societies is really to empower physical scientists. And today we can't pursue that in, in the era that we live in. We cannot pursue that mission without being a digital organization. And we can't empower undergraduate students. We can't cultivate understanding of the history and culture of the physical sciences. We can't engage about bringing about positive change in the STEM enterprise without the power of the internet behind us. This is why we are, as an organization, engaged in a multi-million dollar investment in AIP's digital presence. And if I might brag just a little bit about the physical sciences, being in the home of computer science, perhaps here in New York City, um, the physical sciences really have provided humanity with an unprecedented understanding of the natural world and has allowed us to harness nature and construct the remarkable technologies that surround us today. The wonder and awe of our universe that the physical sciences reveals are all around us. 
and deepening our scientific understanding and deploying that understanding to mitigate global, societal and challenging problems and further enhance our lives as human beings is, this, is among the central goals of the physical sciences today. And at AIP and with our member societies, we sit at the nexus of that effort. Our mission is to advance, promote and serve the physical sciences for the benefit of humanity. And we adopt the broadest view of the physical sciences while we pursue our, that mission. Our mission is manifested through the programs we offer, whether it's with students or in the area of history or um, in our work to promote diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging and accessibility to make sure we've got a more just and inclusive physical ent science enterprise. We as a federation of 10 member societies representing over 120,000 scientists, engineers and teachers and students, etc. And our affiliates represent a community more 300,000 scientists and engineers, etc. We strive very much with those organizations to be uh, a thought leader in the physical sciences, a community that tries to drive uh, a, a research and analysis that engages in positive change. And one of the areas we're engaged in positive change is in the area of DI, which is a program that we have called Team Up, Team Up Together, which is a very focused program to double the number of African Americans graduating in physics and astronomy by the year 2030. We are engaged heavily in that project. AIP Foundation is helping us raise the supports to get, to get there, to get to that goal. And some of the students that we support in that program are here this evening, and I hope you've had the chance to meet some of them. So thank you to allow me to talk a little bit about AIP. I know I'm not the main reason why you're all here. It is to engage in the fireside chat. But before moving on, I want to pass over to my friend, uh, Franz Cordova, the Honourable Franz Cordova, who's chair of the AIP Foundation Board of Trustees. Franz. Thank you, Michael, and hello, everyone. Welcome to a great birthday party. So it's a little bit different than when you were 10 years old and running around with your hockey sticks and stuff and throwing cake around. This will be a more uh, civilized party, but I guarantee you just as exciting and we will go to new places. As chair of the board of trustees of the AIP Foundation, I'm really thrilled to be co-hosting this event with our generous partner, Google Cloud. And I, I think this is just, as you will agree, an absolutely amazing facility. Of course, I, I haven't been here before, but I expected no less. So I'm really glad that my expectations were met here with this, uh, uh, this uh, gorgeous place. I want to thank Google Global Networking and Google Cloud for their partnership and generosity in making tonight a memorable event. I'm so proud to call both Sandeep Giri and Vince Cerf my fellow colleagues on the AIP Board of Trustees. And we have a number of other board members present here uh, as well, and I'm so glad you've joined us tonight. I'm also fortunate to call Vint a personal friend who I've known for a number of years. I've even run into Vint in airports and that sort of thing, uh, which both do a lot of. Uh, but uh, and Vint, I didn't comment during the toast on your sartorial uh, expertise. Vint always has a beautiful three-piece suit, and I looked so hard for a three-piece suit to wear tonight to honor you. So I'm sorry, I fa failed in that. Um, and in fact, when Bob mentioned his lion story, I couldn't help thinking of the movie, The, the Lions in the Wardrobe. We have both here today. So, um, Vint and Bob, I'm really honored to be celebrating not only your transformational invention of the TCP IP protocol, but also, of course, your birthdays, which we heard just a few minutes ago, are exactly uh, six months apart, and we're right in the middle of those uh, great birthdays. So, uh, again, happy birthday to you both. It's wonderful. Michael mentioned the wonderful programs that AIP is doing to empower physical scientists. As chair of the AIP Foundation, I have a front row seat to the exciting things that are taking place at AIP and the Foundation. AIP Foundation's role is to raise money 
so that the programs are well-funded and able to deliver excellence to its stakeholders. And Michael told you about some of those programs, especially our latest, uh, the Team Up program. The foundation is only able to fulfill this important role with the support of donors like Google, the Simons Foundation, the Heising Simons Foundation, and many, many others, including many in this room. So I want to thank each of you for your uh, generosity in supporting the very impro important programs that make a difference in people's lives. Uh, and especially, I want to uh, acknowledge the young people that are in the audience today that are being uh, supported by some of these programs. Together, I know we can make an impact on the future of the physical sciences. So again, I'm very pleased to be with you tonight. I hope you enjoyed this evening. And next, I'd like to invite my colleague, Sandeep Geary from Google to the podium. Thank you, Franz. All right, good evening, everybody. Um, it is uh, really great to bring AIP and Google together for this event. Uh, I should mention it's six months in the making. Uh, that's how long it takes to put something like this together. It was educational for me. Um, <laughs> a little bit about GGN, which is one of the co-sponsors of the event, that GGN is honored to be hosting this event uh, for Vint and Bob, the fathers of the internet. Very, very happy to have you both here. Um, a little bit about Global networking, it is the team that is responsible for design, development, uh, deployment, and operations of Google's global network that powers all of Google services that some of you might have even used today. Um, uh, GGN continuously expands Google's networks by laying new optical fibers and building hundreds of points of presence worldwide. Uh, many folks don't know how the world is connected through undersea cables, um, and uh, GGN is the team very much responsible for that. Um, the TCP IP protocols that uh, Bob and uh, Vint helped develop were one of the most influential foundational technologies in networking, and eventually that led to the architecture of the internet as we know today. Uh, their lengthy career played pivotal roles in not only enabling Google where it is today, but also what the internet has become. Um, a little bit more about how they have been rewarded by the global community uh, for their work. Um, in 1997, President Clinton presented both of them with the US National Medal of Technology uh, for, for their work. Uh, they received the ACM Alan Turing Award, uh, which is also called the Nobel Prize in Computer Science in 2004. Uh, they received the Presidential Medal of Freedom uh, from George Bush in 2005, which is the highest award given to any US civilians. In 2008, they received the prestigious Japan Prize, the Queen Elizabeth Prize in Engineering in 2013, and they became foreign members in the British Royal Society in 2016. They received the Franklin Medal you need a room to keep all of these things. <laughs> and this is the shortened list, by the way. Um, the IEEE Medal of Honor, which Vint received, and the Macaroni Society Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, and with that, I would like to welcome Bob and uh, Vint up here. And I'm so glad you guys are here to make this event possible. So I would like to welcome you both. Yeah. Should we join Katie? Yeah. Yes. Oh, all right. I guess we should go. All right. All right. I'll, I'll talk about Katie. Yeah. Okay. Can I have the mic? Okay. Uh, I'd also like to introduce Katie, uh, who is our moderator today. Um, so Katie is an author and a longtime tech journalist who was on the staff of the New York Times for more than a decade. And she still writes uh, advanced obituaries for the Times. She's the author of six nonfiction books covering a whole range of topics from the origins of the internet, computer hackers, uh, pianists, Glenn Gould, and uh, the German reunification. Quite a range of topics, Katie. 
Um, her first novel, The Boys, was published last year, um, and she's a co-creator and host of the popular podcast Lost Women in Science, and she lives in San Francisco with her husband, Bob Wachter. Uh, welcome, Katie. Thank you. Well, uh, I think we need a kind of a bio recap, if you don't mind. Uh, this is a buddy movie, if ever there was one. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to try to go really quickly through uh, Vin and Bob's uh, lives. So hold on. So Vin was born in New Haven, Connecticut on June 23rd, as we know, 1943. Happy 80th, a few months late. Um, and you have been doing this stuff since high school, which actually makes your life into a multiple buddy movie because you went to Van Nuys High School with Steve Crocker and John Postel, That's right? right. Who That's right. we will, um, I hope we'll talk about them at least a little bit. Uh, John Postel in particular because he died very, very young and very tragically. And while you were in high school, you were involved in writing statistical analysis software at Rocketdyne. So you come by all of this very honestly. You, uh, <laughs> you then went to Stanford. You got a degree in mathematics. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Um, yes. And then there was IBM. There was grad school at UCLA, and uh, where you got your master's and your PhD. And this is where it turns into kind of a sliding doors phenomenon where the key event, and correct me if you think I'm wrong, wait, this is interactive. Yes. That, <laughs> okay. that it was working in Len Klein Rock's networking group at UCLA with Crocker and Postel. That's correct. Um, where the first ARPANET, no oh, I must actually confess that I know this story because <laughs> I, <wrote, laughs> I wrote a book uh, called Where Wizards Stay Up Late about all of this. Um, and you can see, if you see, this is a wonderful photo of the, what we call the imp guys from BBN, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. And there's Bob in a very chic, groovy looking black, black tur turtle black turtleneck right. in the front. <laughs> uh, we're getting a little kind of, yeah, like beatnik-like. Anyway, well, so. I, I'm, okay, so you said it's interactive, so I can interrupt. <laughs> Two things. Wait, First of your all, your life isn't over yet. It, well, I understand, but uh, so just you, you pulled that book out, and I just want to say that this is one of the most interesting and fun books to read, partly because I know all the people that are involved. That makes it interesting. But uh, the important thing is she wasn't writing uh, one of those dry as dust you know, uh, renderings of what happened when and blah, blah, blah. This, she gets into the people and the interactions, which were as much uh, Im uh, as important as the technology. And so it's a, a frequently, a book which is frequently referred to uh, to study the origins of the internet, largely the ARPANET story, in which Bob plays a really significant role. Okay, you can go back. To, I'll, I want to talk about your other book later, The Boys, which is really an amazing book. Okay, yeah, go ahead. let me just say, I've written six nonfiction books and I actually had to start making stuff up because, <laughs> you know, trying to get stuff right was just really driving me crazy. So I wrote a novel which Vint likes a lot. That's all we have to say about that. Right? Actually, it can, if I can make one, one comment about that, um, Kay, Katie is one of the most interesting writers that I've ever read. When I read when, Where Wizards Stay Up Late, I went through it from beginning to end and it was fascinating. It really was. Um, there was one part, you may remember it, because I came to visit you in Austin, Texas. I came to Austin, where I was living. Yeah, at so the time. And Katie did uh, a yeoman's job in trying to figure out what the internet was about. Talked to a lot of people. And some of the people told you things that weren't quite right, if you remember. And Are we going to get into all that? No. Okay. No, okay. I'm, I'm okay. about no. to... Well, finish. we can. We can, we can. It's interesting. I mean, history... Uh, Revision. Okay, yeah, forget it. Okay, so, well, for now. Anyway, back to Vince's life, where we're still in the middle of it. Um, so you worked at Stanford, then DARPA, then MCI, uh, and, um, and when you um, worked at MCI, I wrote a, um, a profile of you, which I'm going to um, read a little bit of an excerpt from later. But then, here we have, um, and you have since... Uh, this bears mentioning, uh, since 2005, been here at Google That's right. um, as a vice president and chief internet evangelist, uh, which brings us to Bob, 
who was born December 23rd, as we now know, 1938, happy birthday early, uh, and you got your undergraduate degree in electrical engineering. Please correct me if I'm wrong, because I pulled this off Wikipedia, you just never know. And um, from City College of New York, and then in quick order, you got your master's and PhD from Princeton, also in electrical engineering. Um, but I'd like to back up to where our two heroes met each other, which I believe was at UCLA low these many years ago. Yes. Um, when Bob was working at BBN at Bull Baranek and Newman in, um, in Boston. Cambridge, on, actually. In Cambridge. I'm sorry. Yeah, you're absolutely Close. correct. Right. See, Wikipedia. Um, in the on the first interface interface message processor, also known as the IMP, and the technology was so new that when BBN got this government contract in the late 1960s to build the first interface message processor, Senator Edward Kennedy yes. from Massachusetts sent the company a telegram congratulating the team on the contract for the interfaith message processor. Yeah. They, he was congratulating BBN for its ecumenical efforts. <laughs> Actually, I had a copy of that on one of those little three by five uh, glass slides back then. The telegram? The telegram, and I gave it, when they had a memorial ceremony for Lick who passed away, I gave it to his wife, Louise. Oh, oh. So I don't have it anymore, but I had for a long time. So that was then. Um, and then Bob became uh, director of IPTO, uh, the Information Processing Techniques Office, following in the hallowed footsteps of um, JCR, uh, JCR Licklider, to whom we um, dedicated Wizards. Um, and then, uh, fast forwarding just a bit, Bob and Vint famously sketched out on a yellow legal pad at a hotel in Palo Alto, the Cabana Hyatt, an idea for an internet protocol. The fundamental communication protocols at the heart of the internet to pair with, the, with TCP, um, the transmission control protocol they, they wrote they sketched. So when they won the Turing Award, I wrote a story about this for the Times, and here's what I wrote. They wrote, they sketched, they argued, all the while passing a yellow legal pad back and forth to capture ideas as they crystallized. When they emerged two days later, <laughs> they knew they had the makings of a solid technical paper. What they did not know was that they had created the essential underpinnings of today's vast and sprawling internet. So um, in 2004, as we now know, thanks to Sandy, Bob and Vint won the Turing Award um, for their work on TCP IP. And, um, and then um, uh, Bob has gone on, went on in 1986, right, to start CNRI. And, and Vint was your second employee, but part-time, right? For six months, he was because they couldn't part, afford it. Our time, time. Yeah. afford him. In yeah. fact, I, we ended up paying him more than I paid myself. Wow, I didn't know that. <laughs> I so, funny. I hope anymore. you don't regret that. <laughs> <laughs> not a bit. Not a bit. Oh, so when when the paper first came out, the TCP/IP paper, which was called a protocol, the title was a protocol for packet network interconnection. Intercommunication. Intercommunication. Oh, I'm sorry, intercommunication. Thank you. This, again, can I just please blame Wikipedia? Um, although I did write this story in the Times, I should have looked at that one. Anyway, so <laughs> what I wrote in this, this, the story that I, um, uh, when they won the Turing Award, and this was in 2004 That's that right. you won the well, Turing the, the Award. The award was actually, the party was in 2005, but the I award see. was The award in was in 2004, but we were on top of the news. Yeah. Um, it was a first edition of the paper was being auctioned at Christie's um, as part of a larger sale of computer science papers being sold by a collector in Novato, California, and was expected to sell for two to three thousand dollars. Do you know what happened? What? No. Yeah. Yes. What happened? It sold for forty-eight thousand. So I immediately roamed around in my basement to see if I could find any more original <laughs> copies. You know. But I didn't find any. He has. I have that. But you have to have the original journal. 
Yes, it, the actual yellow. It, and it has his address label on it, too. Yeah. I mean, you know, got the that's going to be worth a lot more. On. Oh, that's amazing. Did you sign wow. it? I, mean, I can. I can. Value, would it? <laughs> it wouldn't matter when I signed it. Does it work like retroactively? Does that you know work? what paper? This was the third most valuable paper they claimed at the time behind Einstein's paper on general relativity. Wow. Which people should know about in this audience. And Schrodinger's paper on quantum mechanics. Wow. Okay. I'm really glad I brought that up. But that was so, early on, so maybe it'll change as time goes on. <laughs> So I'm going to start with a bit of an icebreaker, although I think we already broke it. Um, and that is that in 1994, so pretty much 30 years ago, yes. I wrote a profile uh, in the Sunday Times um, about Vin. And I just, I love this story so much, I just have to read it uh, because it really <laughs> speaks to Vin. <clears throat> At a 1992, oh, and by, just to give you context, this was when it was controversial whether TCP/IP was going to be adopted. Yes. The, um, sort of the, the underpinnings of the internet, so there was quite a quite a battle going on about it. Um, at a 1992 meeting that marked a pivotal juncture for the internet protocol, engineers were at one another's throats over a controversial issue. Dr. Cerf took the podium and announced that he had some informal remarks to make and proceeded to strip. I removed my coat, waistcoat, tie, and finally my dress shirt, he recalled. He stopped when he reached a t-shirt emblazoned with IP on everything. <laughs> and it's... And, and <laughs> Wait, it goes on, it goes on. No, and uh, just, just to make it clear, it was the letters I and P, P. not I-P-E-E. Oh, yeah, yeah, good point, right, right, good point. An inside joke referring to the ubiquity of the internet protocol. The audience, he said, went nuts, and the tension dissolved. One member of the audience rushed to the podium and placed a $5 bill yes. in Dr. Surf's waistband. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Somewhere on the internet, there's a video of that. But really? I haven't Do you think found so? It. Been... Okay, we're going to need to find that. Okay. So, um, anyway, that's, that's that. So, right off the bat, however, um, let's talk about, you know, when, when I wrote Wizards, um, I, a lot of what we were doing at the very beginning was debunking the popular myth of why the ARPANET started. And I wanted to ask both of you, why it started, and why there's a frequent misunderstanding about its origins. I think that's something you should answer, Bob. Well, um, I guess the way to think about it was this was really had its origins in the mid-1960s, maybe even a little before. There had been some musings about networking by people like Lynn Kleinrock wrote a PhD on QE networks, more of a theoretical uh, analysis of you know, how things move around. Um, Donald Davies in the United Kingdom was at, uh, in London, did some work on that and actually got no money to help support him, but he built a one node network. You know, it's like a telephone system with one telephone. Um, wasn't very effective, but he could show that if you type on one terminal, it can pop out on another in the same room. Um, and a fellow named Paul Barron, who was at the Rand Corporation, was writing about survivability in nuclear war. And uh, this was a very interesting time. I had a, rel a relative that I had only met maybe once or twice in my life, Herman named Kahn. Herman Kahn, who wrote a book on thermonuclear war, and thinking about the unthinkable. Um, but the, 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 the documentation that Paul did was basically to help get through nuclear war. It was a survivability kind of thing. At a time when there were no electronics to speak of, he was talking about hot potato routing from AM radio stations around the country. So these ideas were floating around. He couldn't raise any money to build it. The biggest issue that, that will show up in the internet story is when we tried to get the internet going, it wasn't solving a real defense problem at the time. 
Uh, and so that's what made it really hard for me to get it going when we first started it back in 1972, 73, that time frame. But with the ARPANET, DARPA itself came up with a rationale. That is, if you wanted to buy, uh, let's say, a megabyte memory disk at that time, it would cost like a million dollars. Today, it's pennies, but back then it was very expensive. And every one of the universities wanted more storage. And so if you bought a big, you know, a big disk, a megabyte disk for Harvard, let's say, then Carnegie Mellon would come in and ask for the same thing and couldn't afford it. And so the network allowed us to share these large scale resources. The DARPA was also building something called ILIAC-4, one of the very first supercomputers before Cray was on the scene. And there'd only be one of them. So people wouldn't necessarily have to go to Illinois to, to get use of it. So if you looked at it from a technical perspective, the office that I later ran actually had all the motivation for building a net to be more efficient in what it did, be more economical in what it did, and to allow sharing of resources and, and maybe even to get computer programs to figure out how to talk to other computer programs. We're still a long way from having solved that problem, but we've solved a lot of the other problems along the way. If you look at it from the perspective of the DARPA management, they saw this as something that could potentially help the DOD big time. Command and control related stuff and, and the like. So there were all kinds of reasons for it. And so people conflate those two different notions. Mm -hmm. Was this really solving a DOD problem? And the answer is conceptually for some, maybe the, even the director of the agency, that was the bottom line. But for the technical people working on it, this was just a really interesting right. technical challenge. How would you build a network? How would you make it work? How do you get computer programs to interact with mm -hmm. other ones? And it just took over from there. And so there are some people who look at it and say, you know, now oh, the guys at DARPA couldn't make up their mind. You know, mm -hmm. was it this or was it that? Was it really about, you know, building a network to move bits around? Or was it mm -hmm. applications that could run on them? Mm -hmm. and, you know, those stories uh, kind of persisted in terms of DARPA was confused when DARPA was anything but confused. They knew exactly what they were doing, and they were doing all these, it was like a quantum mechanical project. It had multiple different things that all kind of matured at the same time. Yeah, and let's talk about the, um, well, first of all, let me just ask you, as, you know, two super smart guys, what did you individually see as the as the intellectual theoretical experimental challenge of this of the arpanet mm -hmm. or, or, well, or the internet for that well there are two parts of it but let's focus on arpanet for the moment i mean the task that i took on was really the kind of the system responsibility for the communications part the whole goal was could you get bits from here to another computer and to do it kind of reliably and, and so forth and, and really quickly. But I spent no time thinking about what the computers would do with these bits when they got there. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's actually why Vint and I became natural parties in, in developing the internet because he brought a perspective on this that I didn't have and I think I brought a perspective that he, he may not have had he can speak for himself. But, you know, I started my career out at Bell Labs. You, you didn't mm -hmm. actually mention that, but I was, I was in the communications field when I, when I became an uh, assistant professor at MIT. I was teaching communications theory, information theory, circuits and systems. I came from that oh, really? analog side kind of, of the, the world. Kind of the Claude Shannon Claude, school. We, yeah. You know, yeah. Claude Shannon's office was 249. Erwin Jacobs... Uh, who started uh, Linkabit and then Qualcomm was 245, 345. Amazing. Right next to mine and in between the two of them was Jack Wozenkraft, with which whom Erwin wrote the famous and, and basic textbook in the field of communications. So it was a very small group of very high powered. I was the youngest one in that whole group by far. I was like 20, mid 20s when I joined. And Jack was a real good friend of mine and, and remained there for a long time. But, you know, he and I would often have conversations about, you know, me and as a theoretician, you know, what would it take to get tenure on the faculty? Mm -hmm. And 
he would say things like, you may be the smartest guy in this group, which I thought was a little bit of a stretch because there were a lot of smart people there. In fact, everybody in MIT was smart. But he said, you gotta show you can do something, which is in fact, the reason why I finally took a leave of absence from MIT, thinking I'd go back in you know, a year or two, go do something. And I went to work at BBNN. I don't know if you're gonna get to this later and I'm taking the wind out of your sails, but I started to work on computer networking. That was, and everybody told me I was throwing my career away. There was no future. <laughs> in, wow. No, you have to remember. I'm glad you didn't listen to him. You know, in, <clears throat> and that's part of my, my personality, who I am. But I, I tend to make up my own minds and I listen to myself a lot. And also my wife, Patrice. <laughs> <laughs> Although she may not always agree with that. Um, <laughs> so back in those days, you know, the, the, there were very, there were almost no computers in DOD, maybe some accounting machines, big batch machines. Mm -hmm. In the universities, there were quite a number of machines, but they were also batch machines for the, for the most part. There were a handful of time-sharing systems around. And so none of the universities wanted to make their computing resources available to others, and so it was not a wellspring of interest in this topic. And I was being told, you're throwing your career away. Work on something with people care about. But I got real interested and, you know, a number of years later, it turned out to have merit. Fell in with the imp guys. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, they thought I was just a uh, kind of a marginal theoretician from MIT, as, as you probably know from your work on the thing. I think the guys in that field really marginalized my contribution mm -hmm. because they thought, you know, if, if you are somebody who needs to build a building, you need to know about steel beams and concrete, laying electrical wires. It's the implementation side right. that was everything to them. Mm -hmm. But if you were building a nuclear reactor, you might want to know something about electrons and protons and fission and fusion and all of that sort of stuff. So that's what I brought to the table. And I think it wasn't, it wasn't that well rec recognized at the time. And so that's why some of the stories that you heard weren't really accurate stories because you heard them from people who had a, a kind of a skewed version of things. But that's all behind us at this point in time. You know, this is this actually rather funny in a way because when uh, I was at UCLA, uh, I was uh, doing a dissertation that had nothing to do with networking. Uh, but I got infected with the ARPANET project. That's where Bob and I met. And when I got to Stanford, uh, and had, was pursuing this uh, the work on TCP IP, the head of the electrical engineering department decided that what I was doing was not electrical engineering, that it, he read my papers and said, there are no equations, this is philosophy, uh, and you know, this is this not is engineering. This is philosophy? Yeah, this is not engineering. Well, you know, when you, when you are describing the architecture of how systems are gonna interact with each other, it has a certain philosophical character oh, to it. You know, there are principles and uh -huh. you try to follow them. So I, I, I was kind of rejected by engineering as not being a real engineer. Mm -hmm. And uh, so um, I, I, I'm sort of happy now to look back on that and say, you got it wrong. You know? <laughs> Rel rel relative to where I was, you were absolutely a real engineer. I mean, there was no question about that. But, uh, so uh, let's, since we're, here, thanks to AIPF, I'd love to bring physics into this okay. uh, because there is this very close connection between so many things in computing and networking that um, intersect with physics. There's solid state physics, there's quantum physics, there is thermodynamics. Uh, and all of this, and it really makes me think a lot about understanding how it works when you're dealing with things like that. I mean, just Moore's Law, for instance, it's really physics, right? So I'll tell you an interesting story about physics. I got to know and work with a fellow at uh, Caltech, um, uh, who's very well known in, in this field. Uh, there was a conference that MIT was supporting, it was called the physics, I'm sorry, it's called the computation of physics. It was all about using computation to sort of simulate what went on in, in physics. And they wanted to bring a lot of physicists to, to deal with that issue. And they wouldn't come with that as a topic. They wanted the conference to be retitled The Physics of Computation. 
Mm. You're much more com- comfortable with that. Really? There was a group um, in MIT that was, we were funding it. It was, they were working on reversible computing. What, what does that mean? Uh, they wanted to build computers where you kind of had a forward and a reverse switch. So if you ran a computation and you saw something that was wrong, you could flip the switch and run the computation so, backwards. So this, this would be, by example, if you had added five and four, you could figure out that, uh, that when you got nine and then you reverse the computation, it wasn't, it six, wasn't six plus three, it was right. five plus four, which is pretty incredible when you right. think about it. So, uh, and the guy that I was working with at Caltech was named Richard Feynman, who's pretty well known in the field. It brings a bell, yeah. So, uh, Amazing. The, the way that this reversible computing worked was it had, uh, in, in the original formulation, a three input, three output gate, Mm-hmm. It's called a Fredkin gate because Ed Fredkin, who was on the faculty at MIT, came up with that formulation. Mm-hmm. One of them was a control line. Either had a one or a zero, and if it had a one on that line, it meant take the other two inputs, which are data inputs, and 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 pass them straight through. Otherwise, if it, it was a zero, flip them. Oh wow! And with that formulation, he showed you could build. These, the the, but they couldn't figure out how to build that mm-hmm. that device. And later they were able to show, not me, this is none of my work, I was just funding the effort, that you could build one of these three input, three out devices with six two input, two output devices that had the property that if you had a signal on both inputs, they went straight through. And if you had a signal on only, on only one or none, they would swap. And you put them together in a strange way to do that. And so the question that I was asking myself is, okay, if you had magnetic bubbles coming in on each side because you're doing magnetic bubble technology, you can imagine building a device, and we, 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 I, I was, we was able to describe it, where the bubbles would bounce off each other and go out if both of them were there. But if they didn't, the bubble would sort of be deflected and go out the other side. Mm-hmm. And then I asked myself, well, suppose these were electrons coming in there. And I didn't have to think about that. So that's what we started to work on. And he got real interested in that. The problem was, how do you synchronize the electrons so they bounce off exactly right and go up? Exactly? Wait, Feynman got interested in that? Yeah, and he, he was working on that toward the end of his life. It was one of his, I couldn't solve that problem. Didn't even know how to think about it. But that's what he and I would wow. were working on. So physics got into this somehow because ultimately physics underlines Mm-hmm. Much of what we do, if not everything. Right. So much of what, yeah. Um, well, let's do a quick recap of the TCPIP collaboration. And I, I really want you both to address why it was so important that TCPIP be um, adopted over its competition. Well, I mean, when you work really hard on something, you don't want people to throw it away. I, mean, I, mean, I get that. I totally you know, my, get that. My, no, I, get, I, I get it. But know, there's, just, there's just, more to it. Well, I mean, despite what the, uh, the uh, engineering head said about me not being an engineer, I really like to build things that people can use. I like to build practical things. So the, it turned out there was a lot of competition in this space. The, the ARPANET was a tremendous success. And it spawned um, a number of different networking activities. One uh, standard for this was called X25 and X75 that came out of the Consultative Committee uh, on Information Technology, CCITT. And it was led in part by Larry Roberts, who was the former head of IPTO and who initiated the ARPANET project. So that was one standard that spread quite rapidly and very successfully. But it didn't um, attack the uh, situation of uh, heterogeneous networks, which is what Bob and I were working on. Mobile packet radio, satellite-based networks, the original ARPANET, and eventually Ethernet, all of which were packet switched but were were very different. So TCP IP was trying to overcome a non-uniform heterogeneous problem of different kinds of networks. And ironically, uh, by 1978, we pretty much gone through four iterations of the TCP IP implementation and design and, and uh, essentially froze that. Uh, by that time, I was at ARPA working for, uh, for Bob, and I wanted to freeze the design, get it implemented on as many operating systems as possible, and then, uh, uh, and then switch everybody over 
who was on the ARPA-sponsored networks to that new protocol. Well, in 1978, that's when the Europeans started the Open Systems Interconnection Protocol design uh, in the International Standards Organization because they didn't want anything to do with this, uh, you know, military thing, this TCP/IP thing. This is really this important. You guys pay attention. Sponsored by. <laughs> Sponsored by, you know, the Department of Defense. So uh, they went off on this other very similar um, angle. Uh, the protocols were not terribly different, but they were not good and interoperate. They had some different principles. They had seven layers, and we only had four. Um, and I remember when I first saw that protocol, my first question was, where's the Internet layer? Uh, yeah. And it didn't exist. They didn't have one. That's didn't right. have one. So they used X25, which was very uniform compared to the uh, non-uniformity of the networks that we were trying to do. Virtual circuits. So I, what was, apart from the fact that uh, we were very heavily invested in the design of this uh, protocol, and lots of other people were too as a result by that time, five years later, but I also believed that, it, that the alternatives uh, were not going to be as rich uh, in their capacity to expand and, and adopt new technology as this one. On top of which, we had an, a huge amount of experience implementing and testing these things. And the team that was working on the OSI was much more focused on documenting everything before they built anything. We had a different view, which is build it to figure out if it's going to work. If it doesn't work, keep working on it till it works, then document it. So that, that was the path we took. Except we documented it first. Well, we wrote something, but wrote the, the thing that we wrote <clears throat> was not precisely the same thing as ultimately got implemented. It wasn't an implementation description. That's it was right. a so, so I was very uh, uh, concerned that we have something that would really work mm -hmm. for uh, the community that needed it. And we were focused at that time, of course, on DOD and the ability of packet switch networks to handle not only data exchange, but packetized voice and packetized video. Um, so, so that's why it was important from my point of view. And it took us a long time. It took from 1978 to 1993 to get to the point where the community- And the t-shirt. I'm sorry? The, <laughs> and the IP on everything t-shirt. Yeah, 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 well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it took us those 15 years to get to the point where it was acknowledged broadly that the TCP IP protocols were suited uh, and fit for purpose. Uh, and were adopted. And by that time, not only had commercial products been uh, created, like Cisco Systems in 1984, uh, and Proteon, and eventually Juniper and others, Ethernets were being built in the early 1980s. The NSF decided to implement TCP IP for the NSF net backbone, as did the Department of Energy and NASA, too. So we had four backbone networks in the mid 1980s. Uh, and at that point, we were right on the cusp of commercialization of the network service, which started in 1989 with the three networks. So it, it was important from my point of view uh, to get this stuff in place and available broadly. Available is a key word. Key. I'm sorry? The, of the word available is key. Well, yeah. And, and I was eager to see this turn into a commercial enterprise because I couldn't figure out how the general public and the private sector would get access to this without having an economic engine supporting it. And up until 1989 anyway, it was all U.S. government funding for all of those backbone networks in the United States. And there were a number of obstacles along the way, not the least of which was we wanted to get the European community working with us because they had different networks over there. And the carriers in Europe basically mandated the use of X25 to right. connect to their networks. Yeah. So you would think on the, they thought on the balance that would make it impossible for anybody to, I used to deal with the organization there that uh, was a, an organization of PTTs, it was called the Committee of European PTTs, which I had its acronym CEPT, I always mm -hmm. thought that meant the Commission to Eliminate Progress in Telecommunications. <laughs> <laughs> But they, they made this mandate, and along comes a group at CERN, which is well known for the, starting the web, uh, and Cisco had built a router that actually had X25 on one side, but it had Ethernet out the other end. 
And so the folks at CERN connected to the local oh, nets wow. using X25 as mandated, mm -hmm. but everybody could connect in through ethernets and then everything just sort of poured over those networks as if they were just, oh, you know, great. big wires. So th that was one challenge, but you know, there was a lot of resentment in the part of the international community who thought the ISO stuff should be the, the end game. And I think today they still think that to some extent. Really? But, but there's just yeah. maybe not so many people anymore, yeah. but uh, yeah. a few. Uh, but they're you know. dead. Uh, so <laughs> anyway, uh, I wanted to ask you about this this phenomenon that has always fascinated me. I hope it interests you. If not, don't even go there. But uh, it's this idea in science of the time is ripe. And um, mm -hmm. this idea that it's a confluence of the right conditions and technology and economics, the right spark, the right people. And which I'm, it's my thesis that that led to the internet at the time. And I wanted to ask you, um, and I'm thinking, for instance, about packet switching mm -hmm. um, and other aspects of networking. I wanted to ask you what parts of those you think were important important could it have started earlier um and what was it about that moment no the, the the reason that this was uh timely is that the cost of computing had come down and it, uh, larry roberts recognized that it was uh cheaper at this at some point to buy a computer to function as a communication device than it was to buy the conventional circuit switching equipment and so it became feasible to build the ARPANET, and as time went on, it became even more feasible to build the internet. So the Moore's Law was helping, cost of computing, and the physical size of computing was also helping. And that's interesting, it's the phenomenon where you get a really fancy, expensive technology, and sometimes over time, it gets cheaper and smaller, until finally you stick it in your pocket, which is not what you did in 1962 mm -hmm. with a time-sharing system that occupied an entire room. So Larry and others we really rode on that, uh, on that cost and size curve. So packet switching became feasible because it was affordable. But I, on kind of a more profound note, was there a seed planted in either of your heads by someone like a JCR Licklider or a Vannevar Bush about what was possible? Well, in, in, in my case, uh, I... I certainly never knew Vannevar Bush, and I had not talked to Licklider, although he had come from BBNN, which is where I was at the time. But when I took the leave of absence, I, I didn't know about DARPA. I didn't know they were interested in networking. I just started to work on it because I thought it was interesting. I later learned that there had been people who had been working on it before me, but... Um, but this idea of a real uh, vision well, they're and really, the well, look, Licklider, Licklider and Engelbart, who was at SRI, and invented the thing that all of you know, the mouse. But that's not the, the really important invention was not that. It was the online system. It was the text editing system that allowed people to share their work and to collaborate. He was all about collaborative work in a computer-enhanced environment. Licklider had similar views of the use of computers as augmenting tools. The two really uh, were quite aligned and bonded, I think. And that was a vision that I felt very strongly about. When the ARPANET project was started, it was billed in the papers that were written about it as a resource sharing activity to allow multiple departments that were funded by ARPA to share their computing resources uh, because they, you know... Are both, both hardware and software. I'm sorry. And both hardware and, and software. software. And that was really important. ARPA did something very clever. They said, we're funding all of you, so, so don't hide your work. Mm -hmm. in order to have an edge on the next year's uh, proposals. Share your work to advance the state of the art as quickly as possible, because we're funding all of you. So just relax mm -hmm. and uh, race ahead. And uh, that was a very powerful uh, innovator. By the time the uh, ARPANET was running, Bob did a, uh, led a demonstration of it publicly in 1972 in Washington. A famous demonstration. It was a, a big deal demonstration. There, there were wonderful stories that Bob Metcalf, the inventor of the Ethernet, tells. AT&T showed up with a contingent of about 10 people, and Bob is the guy that wrote this manual to if people, people could follow to try out the ARPANET applications. And so uh, he's getting them all set up to go. And the imp, or the, actually it was a tip, the terminal imp, 
died right in the middle of the demonstration for the AT&T guys, and they all get big smiles on their faces <laughs> because they knew it wasn't going to work. And of course, it was rebooted very quickly, but by that time, they were gone. The, pol the politics of it was also very important. I mean, Vint was talking more from the technical perspective, but um, politically, AT&T was the dominant carrier in the U.S., and I think it's fair to say their view was they would be happy to roll out a new technology and as soon as it was a business basis for doing it. This was not a business for them. People used to give them very bad, um, bad vibes because uh, you know, they just don't understand it, they can't get it. But they, I think they understood pretty well. It just wasn't a business at the time. And they really didn't get behind it as well as maybe some in the industry because they weren't sure about who had ownership rights in the protocols even though it came out of government. It didn't really turn around until sometime in the mid-1980s for two reasons. A lot of the companies that wanted to sell equipment were now finding that they had sort of maxed out and they wanted to go sell to this other company. They were an IBM shop, so they had a have their equipment compatible with IBM, or it was a deck shop, and they had to have their equipment compatible with that. And when they looked around for something that would work, TCP IP was the only thing around that had a broad base of usage that they could rely on. And I remember uh, when AT&T um, split apart in the mid-1980s, and Bellcore was formed out of Bell Labs, and Bell Labs remained, and they had all the RBOX out there. Uh, they had developed out of Belcor an alternative technology that they thought was going to be the solution for the future. It's called ATM and Sonnet. Uh, oh, yes. ATM it was an asynchronous transfer mode. It was actually circuits in, in between, but they were 53 byte packets, they call themselves. Because it's a prime number? I don't know why they. <laughs> I know at 53, name. that was what they had. And uh, mm -hmm. Belcor set up a meeting. They, I was the only non-Belcor person invited. This was like 1987 or, or so. And on the board, when I walked into this room with a whole phalanx of Belcor folks, was a big circle that said ATM, another big circle that said Internet, and there was a little DS period in between the two. Oh, my gosh. So yeah. it was not like yeah. Roe v. Wade. This was like <laughs> ATM v. Internet. And the question was... How do we put a big box, a big X through this yep. internet circle? And I said, hey, look, you know, I don't know why you invited me here, but if that's what the end result is you want, you invited the wrong guy because I think not only is it not in a good idea, it's not in your interest to make that happen either, even though they thought it was. Because if you can get ATM and Sonnet adopted by all the computer companies who wanted no part of it, to be quite honest, then they're going to have version after version after version. How are you going to make them all interoperate unless you keep everything from version zero around forever? So at the end of a day-long meeting up in Morristown, New Jersey, we, they finally broke up the meeting, somewhat disgruntled, not quite mad at me, but not happy with the results. A year later, they set up another meeting. This time, the goal of the meeting was to figure out how they could buy the Internet. So that if they couldn't kill it, they wanted to own it. And so, then, so we had this long discussion about, suppose you wanted to buy the world economy, what would you buy? Suppose you wanted yeah. to buy the weather, what would you buy? And it became very clear to them that there was nothing to buy. There was nothing to buy, Nothing yeah. to buy. You Just couldn't... The magic of it, right? And when I, I remember leaving the meeting and saying, look, it's a marketplace. Why don't you go compete? Mm -hmm. That's essentially what happened. So we only have 17, 16, 15 seconds left. Um, Why is that in charge? But, Can't we go as long as we well, want? Well, my little countdown clock is telling me. It's, now it's flashing. Oh, dear. So, but if we just so, watch it. Then. Hold on. But I do have, before we go to the questions, yes. I do have to ask you something, which is, because I remember this, and I bet everyone in this room remembers this, um, the moment when you knew that this was, in fact, indistinguishable from magic, that it was really something huge. For me, it was that coffee pot on the web in the UK? Does everyone remember just being able to go on the web and there was the coffee pot? No. Well, that was the webcam. The, the webcam, the, the there webcam. was a web. You could so, go, but go to the you, webcam to see if there's any coffee left in the coffee pot. But like Francis' question about your birthday, I want to know, like your best birthday, like when was the moment that you Well, I know. Knew I, I know when I came to the conclusion that this was going to be a big deal. 
remember, we start in 1973, so my big deal moment is 1988. Uh, one of our uh, mutual friends, Dan Lynch, started a company called Interop, which was to allow people who had built TCP IP capable equipment and software to demonstrate that all their stuff interworked over a big fat yellow cable ethernet. And so Interop stood for interoperability. So I walked in in San Francisco at the Moscone Center in 88, uh, at this Interop show with Eric uh, Benamou, who at the time was the CEO of 3Com, which made Ethernet uh, cards. And uh, the first thing I saw was a two-story Cisco display, which had been, I guess, in, in business for four years at that point. And uh, I looked at this two-story high thing that it was big enough to have people and equipment in it on multiple floors. And I asked Eric, I said, how much do these things cost? And he said a quarter of a million dollars. That was back in 1988. <laughs> and, uh, and that didn't count the cost of the people to man the thing for a week. And I just stood there with my jaw dropping, thinking, my God, somebody thinks they're going to make money out of the Internet. <laughs> and, and then I got to thinking, well, how are we going to get this into the hands of the general public and the private sector? Because at the time, this is 1988, the only use of the Internet as it existed then was for government-sponsored research whether it was DOE or NASA or NSF or DARPA. And I thought, oh, there's this appropriate use policy that will inhibit the interconnection of commercial traffic to the government-sponsored gigantic backbone. So I got permission while Bob and I were working at CNRI to connect the MCI mail commercial system to the NSF net backbone. And I said, to the Federal Networking Council, I just wanted to see whether or not I could get the two technologies to work together. Since I'd worked on both of them, I pretty much knew how to do that. And to my surprise, they agreed to let me do that for a year. And we got it up and running in 1989. And as soon as, you know, now you realize at that point, we're pushing commercial traffic into the backbones of the uh, government-sponsored internet. And then the other email carrier said, well, we want to get in too, and they were given permission to do that. Mm -hmm. They quickly discovered that all their customers that had been uh, in a uh, you know contained environment suddenly could talk to all their competitors' customers mm. through the internet, and that was a bit of that a shock. Weird. And then three commercial internet service providers popped up that same year: UUNet, PSINet, and Surfnet in California. No so for me, that '88 thing was was for a moment of holy moly, this is going to be a big deal. Holy moly! And Bob. Um, I didn't know that it was going to get outside the research community because it took a bill that was pushed by a congressman from Virginia named Rick Boucher in 1993 that opened up what NSF was doing beyond the research community. I thought it would probably stay in the research community unless somebody else outside got a bright idea and did something equivalent. So I think for me, the time was when I showed, I used, I used to watch the NBC nightly news uh, when I got home. And I think it was Tom Brokaw who was yeah. chairing it, and he had on one of his programs, he says, we have a new way for you to communicate with us. There is this new system really? out there, and if you send something to NBC News at, or nightly.com or whatever the really? email address was, we will get your email and we will respond to you through that same medium. I encourage you to do so, and I said, Oh my God! Oh, wow. To me, that that was the real eye-opening moment because that said public at large. I yeah. would I would bet money that that was 1992. It could have because been. that's approximately when people would come to you, hand you the business card, and say, "I apologize for not having an email address on my really? business card." Really? So soon? Yeah. That's that's the first year that I remember yeah. people actually excusing themselves for not having it on their business cards. Wow. So we're going to move to questions. We, so if you have a question in the audience. I can see um, hands up. I wonder if we could turn the lights our, up in yeah, the room. Yeah. Now, um, our yeah. first question is online. Oh, so we're, okay. we're right, toggling between that. online questions and um, people who actually are here. Um, and the first online audience question is, what do you think about newer stream protocols such as SCTP? Why have these new protocols failed to catch on compared to TCP? Well, we tried stream protocols more than once. Uh, for those of you uh, who know about the Internet's design, you know that we're running what's called IP version 4 right now. There's also an IP version 6. And if you're paying attention, you might wonder, what happened to IP version 5? 
And the answer is we, we were trying to do stream protocols using that uh, version of IP, and it did not scale very well. And so, although I'm not an expert on SCTP, I will say that uh, what has happened is that um, we thought that uh, we were going to have to do protocols that would broadcast and multicast traffic. So a single source would transmit a packet, which would be replicated through multiple networks and repeated like a broadcasting system. Mm -hmm. And instead of actually doing that, what happened is that uh, we, first of all, the bandwidths of the internet went up sufficient to allow point-to-point -point, uh, or end-to-end -end connections to stream video and audio, but also content distribution networks came along, like uh, Akamai, for example, out of MIT. And they moved the traffic, the streaming traffic, near to the head ends of the telephone systems or the, or the cable companies. So the data that people were getting from streaming was on a point-to-point -point TCP link, but it's only going over the nearest network from a, a, a content distribution center. So you didn't need the multicasting necessarily. So it's quite surprising to see that, um, that we have not had to, to specialize some of these protocols for stream-based operation. It's amazing when you think about Netflix making a bet on streaming video over the internet. And that was Reed Hastings. And when he did it, I remember thinking, wow, I don't know if that's going to work. And, and, and of course, what happened is that the content distribution capability added the capacity to allow that to work. But he was prescient when he decided to do it. Let me add a little context for this so that you can understand. The, notion, the first time I ever saw the notion of a stream protocol was in a project that I had started at DARPA in the very early days on packetized voice. Mm. As I raised the question, you know, is it possible to take voice, which is showing up in digital form and not sending it over a circuit, but breaking it into packets and sending them out so they're going to take possibly different routes, arrive in different orders, and putting, putting them back together again so that it becomes a continuous yeah, stream. Yeah, what a dumb idea. I mean, you know, we could everything have we did point about point to point links, you know, what's the problem? Everything we did about networking was, was dumb. dumb idea. Yeah. That was the whole idea, it was that, a dumb network. That's why we succeeded. <laughs> Nobody else could see the, the vision there. So anyway, it, it came out of that kind of notion. And of course, the packet video stuff was just mm -hmm. a natural next step. The problem was, in the speech case, how do you actually get to test it? We were dealing with the original ARPA that had 50 kilobit lines. I negotiated that with AT&T. That's all they had at the time that we could make use of. And the only uh, speech compression devices that we get our hands on were 64 kilobits a second. Yeah. So the question was, how do you send 64 kilobits even to one place over a network whose maximum bandwidth was 50? And the computers that were attached, to be quite honest, could basically support a little more than 10 kilobits of the, of the 50. So what we did was we actually showed that this could work by literally pre-positioning a voice communication that we wanted to send at the destination. It was Lincoln Lab in this case. Mm. And what we sent from the other end was something that said, OK, I'm sending packet one. But we wouldn't actually send packet one. We just say, here's when packet one would have started, but we're sending a tiny little one which would go through this network. And when it showed up at the other end, when it arrived, they would then play out the equivalent of packet one so that we could see what the effect of the network was on these, these transmissions. Oh, wow. And it actually worked out fine. But this was a kind of an emulation, if you will. Mm -hmm. And then right. we proceeded to fund other efforts to get lower rate compression. I set a goal in that program of getting uh, average data rates of under 1,000 bits per second when people thought it was impossible. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. But the idea of 1,000 bits a second was based on uh, essentially getting data compressed to something like maybe 2.4 kilobits, which was done later with some work out of AT&T on LPC, uh, linear predictive coding. And then, you know, if one side is sending, the other side doesn't have to send, well, it halves a and then we didn't have to send all the silences. And so we actually were able to show that we could get under 1,000 bits, even though some of the experts in the field thought that's crazy and will never happen, and then said, oh, I guess it can. <laughs> and that was just a starting point for this. What, what happened back then is 
is similar to what happened with the VOIP stuff when the commercial industry got involved in it later on. But in, in its core architectural features, it's the same thing that we did back in the late 1970s. So I, okay, I, you, I, got, you guys can geek out like offline because uh, no, I no. do want to make sure... I do want to make sure that we get to a few more questions. Or okay. we can well, I do, I do have one tiny story about this. We got, we got down, to L, we I got tried. the LPC-10 was the linear predictive code with 10 parameters. Your voice is, uh, the track is modeled as a stack of 10 cylinders with a formant frequency exciting and think of it as pitch. And it got it down to 1,800 bits a second. And, uh, but the thing is that uh, anybody who talked through the system would sound like a drunken Norwegian. <laughs> And, and I, I had to demonstrate this to a bunch of generals at the Pentagon. And I was trying to figure out, how am I going to do this? And, and I thought, OK, one of the guys that worked on this project with us was Ingvar Lund from the Norwegian Defense Research Establishment. <laughs> so I had Ingvar uh, call through the Autovon system, which is the circuit switch uh, voice system in the Pentagon. And then we had him talk through the linear predictive code packet speech system, and it sounded exactly the same. And, and, <laughs> And, and, and Ingvar and we, was drunk. Yeah, we, yeah, well, uh, well, we didn't tell the generals that everybody would sound that way. Sorry, I, I just couldn't resist. That, no, that was pretty great. Um, so, an in-person uh, question. Yeah. There was a hand right up there. By yes. the way, the lights are sufficiently yeah. bright. We can't necessarily make out detail here unless somebody's got X-ray vision. Yeah. Well, but we'll get we know you're transcript human. here. You okay. can see me. Do you need me yeah. to stand up? Yes. Yeah, so I'm Tracy Gilbert. Uh, Team Up Together committee member, and I'm also a small business owner, and we're in the very be beginning stages of commercializing the technology from DARPA. So I have thoroughly enjoyed your geeking out. I have thoroughly enjoyed every single detail, and thank you so much for your contributions. Um, I had a question about resistance to change, and I'd be interested in yeah. hearing you all reflect on the resistance to change from the public and, and from industry? And do you see some of those parallels today with AI, for example? So, oh yeah, you know, the, the whole goal of DARPA was to take on risky propositions and not be afraid to fail. So, you know, virtually everything we tried to do that was new had some kind of resistance, either from an established industrial base that this was competing with or something like that. And so it was part of the Modus operandi, you know, you take that on face value and figure out how to deal with all of the, those issues. So uh, it, it was fun, too. I mean, and we sit down and explain why we we're doing what we we're doing, try to motivate them to join forces with us rather than just, uh, you know, live with the fact that they might be opposed. You know, since you're working in a small business, though, this is actually important. Some of you will know the book, The Innovator's Dilemma where you get a big company and it says, I don't want to do this little thing because we don't know if it's going to grow into a big thing or not, and we're only interested in big things, so you know, let's not bother. Which is why small businesses are so important, because they're willing to take the risk, uh, and they have a vision of what's possible. Uh, so, but this has been around for a long time, so more power to you. Just stick with your guns. Don't let anybody tell you you can't do it. That's why you hire young people, by the way, because they're too young to know you can't do that. <laughs> so true, so true. So the next question is online. What are, here we go. What are your thoughts on how AI might shape the inner, oh gosh, golly. So uh, okay, we have to talk about the internet with a capital I versus a lowercase. I'd love for you to address that. But anyway, might shape the internet in the future. Well, can I start by saying artificial intelligence is a two words that need to be understood as to what they mean. When I started at DARPA, we were funding all kinds of things under the artificial intelligence program that you view as engineering. Operating systems seem like artificial intelligence. Take one machine and it could deal with multiple people simultaneously. It must be artificial intelligence. In the early days of expert systems, that's what, that's what that yes. was. So these are just, you know, if-then production rules that when you went through them, they could produce a result. So I think you need to understand what it is. I mean, artificial intelligence is about, you know, software creation and development that maybe many people think can't be done today. And then the minute you look into it and figure out how to do it, it becomes just engineering and it moves out of the 
the complex of, uh, of artificial intelligence. There was so much hype on this. I'll tell you one related story. I was asked to write a paper for Daedalus Magazine. This is the Association of American Arts and Sciences up in Boston. It's mm -hmm. the oldest of the, the um, scientific societies. And they said I could write any paper I wanted. I said, no, I'd like to decline because I'm not an artificial intelligence researcher. Leave it to the people in the mm -hmm. field, the people that are doing the work to write about what they're mm -hmm. doing rather than a commentator about that. Mm -hmm. They came back to me and they said, no, it's absolutely critical that you write a paper because we know, not true, we know that you're orchestrating this whole thing from behind the scenes. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> oh, wasn't Conspiracy true. Conspiracy theory. It wasn't, right. wasn't. Wow. Wait, the AAAS said that? No, no, no. The American not, Academy not, of uh, this is the one Arts and Sciences. Oh. It's not AAAS okay. in Washington. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's the other, the upper. Uh, oh, the other. So uh -huh. it, wasn't, it wasn't true, but that's, that's the model that people have in their head. They often have. <laughs> wow. Well, uh, so, and they said, um, we, we need you to write an article. And so I said, and you can write anything you want. We don't care. So I said, OK. I wrote an article. It was called Artificial Intelligence, The Reality and the Hype. Because mm -hmm. it was a huge amount of hype about what was AI back then. It still is. And there always will be. <laughs> anyway, um, so I wrote this paper. And it tried to explain what was real and what was this pure fantastic delusion on the part of the population at large. And I presented it at a, a meeting of an August body of reviewers for them at Los Alamos, 1986 or so. I think the report came out in 1987. Oh. And they rejected the paper. <laughs> and they said, that's not what we expected you to write about. <laughs> Even though they said I could write it. They said, we know, this was false, but we know that you masterminded everything. It was all your idea. I mean, when it came to internet, you can put the blame on Benton and myself. Yeah, we did mastermind that. But when it came to AI, no way. What we had was a bundle of funding. Wow. We were reviewing proposals that came in from the community. Mm -hmm. So the ideas were community ideas, that came, just like at NSF. And we were kind of reviewed them, to see if they could have practical impact or make any difference. And they refused to believe me. Mm -hmm. And so the paper never got published. Wow. So, you know, the big pole in the tent right now in artificial intelligence is machine learning, which is a particular kind of artificial intelligence. And it's extremely varied. It's multi-layer neural networks. They are interfaced in various ways. They process the data that goes in at the top in different ways, whether it could be recurrent or some other kinds of things. Sometimes all the data passes through. Sometimes only a portion of it does. So the, the reason that uh, I mention this is that a lot of the power of machine learning is dependent on statistical observation, seeing things uh, in large scale that have patterns that the system can recognize uh, and can react to. So we're st I would say, with regard to this specific question, that one of the areas that I would expect machine learning to be uh, beneficial would be for flow and congestion control. It mm -hmm. could be possibly for some routing algorithms. Mm -hmm. uh, things that have statistical stability now, we know that machine learning is used for a lot of other things, including large language models, which, of course, has generated a much, much of the hype that we see today. But I can see statistically valid reasons for using machine learning uh, in, uh, in the Internet implementations. So I think that's reasonable to anticipate. Of course, and sometimes you look at AI and you decide it stands for artificial idiocy. <laughs> So um, another in-person question. I don't know where. Oh, yes, it's back there. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. The mic is Somebody else here. already has yeah. a mic. Test, test. Hi, uh, Phil oh, there you are. from Google. Okay. Um, I spent a long time thinking about securing uh, the Internet's core routing protocol, yeah. BGP. Uh, so I'm naturally curious uh, when or how did computer security kind of enter your minds about when you're creating the Internet? Uh, well, do you want to start or shall I start? Well, I actually had the responsibility for dealing with security on the original internet, and the problem we faced was that. Oh, you mean the original ARPANET? The original ARPANET. And the problem that we faced was that um, in order to do that in the DoD, there were certain organizational 
folks that needed to be involved. And I interfaced with them, and they weren't sure at that time that networking was real, that it would actually happen. They were so loaded with other responsibilities that they basically didn't want to get involved. And then they wouldn't until it showed up for real. So while many people have said we didn't care about internet in the early days, we cared intensely we couldn't get the right people involved to do a reasonable job on it. Um, we ended up getting, I went and made a proposal to them to build a device that would take traffic from a computer that was needed to be secured, make it available on the net through a cryptographic device. The problem was you couldn't say where it was supposed to go. Because through a that would have been encrypted. It would have been encrypted. So what they were viewing is, well, if you want to do that, use this device and send it to one place only and pre-program the network side of it so it would send everything there. Well, that kind, kind of, of a limited network. That yeah. makes for not a very interesting network. And so I went to them and said, well, why don't we allow a 8-bit bypass around this device? Whatever it is. I didn't care what the, the device was because they had to approve it. And that way we could signal one of 256 places to send the packets, packet by packet. And they basically decided that was just not going to work. Too much, um, too much they uh, could, data could pass around. You know, they the, were not going to allow it to bypass. It would just, it, security wouldn't allow that. About a month later, the chief of that division, whose name is now on a major auditorium at one of the key institutions, uh, called me up and said, they have a great idea. Would we be willing to allow five bits around it? So apparently the difference between mm -hmm. eight and five bits was everything. Mm -hmm. And I said, what a great idea. So they took credit for this idea of the five bits around it, and they got behind it, gave us the cryptos, and we built the devices with a five bit bypass. Mm -hmm which let us get to 32 different sites, which is more than we needed for purpose of military, Demonstrating the yeah, for military yeah. testing. Mm -hmm. But it still wasn't big enough. And, and later on, when they began to see in the DOD writ large that networking was going to play a bigger role, they created some other programs. They, they put internet, I think Bint was involved in that, putting internet protocols into the, these security devices and eventually starting a program of their own. I think it was called Blacker at the time and, and dealing with that. Now there were all kinds of computer security issues and there were all kinds of programs focusing on secure Unix and you know what have you to try and get beyond that, but it was a real struggle in the early days. Mm -hmm. So I would like to respond directly to the routing thing, BGP in particular, the uh, Border Gateway Protocol, which can be hijacked, and it is hijacked, sometimes by accident, sometimes deliberately. So there are several things going on that uh, could improve that. One of them is what's called RPKI, which I suspect you're well aware of. Uh, it's a way of registering uh, a, the portion of the network that you are responsible for, the IP addresses that ha have been assigned to you when you, um, when someone wants to check to see whether or not a packet is, is coming from a legitimate source, they can check the RPI, RPKI registries uh, for that. There's, it gets a little more complicated in BGP because uh, you're running packets through multiple hops of networks and you want to be able to make sure that the path that's being chosen uh, hasn't been uh, hijacked or the, the, the routing information that allows you to figure out how to route the traffic hasn't been uh, modified and interfered with uh, in such a way that you'd route traffic to the wrong place. So I'm a big proponent of putting in BGP SAC. It's been a long, long slog to get that in place. Uh, but I think that plus RPKI is probably the best path we have right now for the uh, securing the border gateway protocols. I think uh, more generally speaking, uh, there's a lot of concern about uh, provenance. Where did data come from? And this is not just about routing, but it's about everything. And more and more people are asking to find ways of assuring that the data they're getting from some source is identifiable as to its provenance. And here I think digital signatures and registrations and things like that will become very much a more common part of the network. Yeah, if I could follow on to Vince's thing, uh, and this is not going to be a security-related comment, but I mean, it's very clear to almost everybody that the real value of the Internet is in making information available. And partly it's creating it, but mainly it's absorbing it and making use of it. 
And I think the, the more effort that we put into understanding the architectural principles behind that will be important. That's, that's a topic that I've been working on for a long time. Vint and I started with that topic back in the 80s. We wrote a paper called The World of Nobots, which we were visualizing as having these mobile programs that had AI capabilities going around and doing interesting things with oh, data that they found. Oh, K-N-O-W. K-N-O-W-B-O-T. Yes, as in knowledge robots. Mm -hmm. As in knowledge robots. Um, so we have been developing a static version of that. We introduced that notion. Well, Vint was still at CNRI at a, just at about the same time that the Mars worm showed up yeah. on the oh, internet. Yeah. And the so, Morris, the 1988 Robert Morris, yep. That's right, so when we... Yep. I mean, I went around to a lot of the different companies that we were dealing with at the time. Google wasn't around, um, sadly. Maybe they would have been more interested, but, you know, the, the companies had no interest in this kind of thing. They don't want somebody else's programs to show mm -hmm. up on their machine and run. That wasn't the end of the story, but that was as far as we could get before they completely turned off. So what we did at CNRI was essentially remove the mobile part from this architecture. That is, if you were a kid growing up in an area where the ice cream truck came by your neighborhood, that's kind of like a mobile repository mm -hmm. of ice cream. Mm -hmm. But you could also go to the local mm -hmm. corner store, maybe 10 blocks away or five blocks. That was kind of a static version. And so if you had static repositories and static um, and metadata about it, the, these objects would let you find out about them. So the thought was that, you know, you can manage these objects. If something showed up on your machine, you could find out everything about it because mm -hmm. it had a unique identifier. That unique identifier would allow you to resolve it to find out where, the, where it came from or get metadata about it. And as I was looking at, you know, the way networks themselves could operate in the future, uh, I gave a talk at the, uh, one of the conferences in The Hague. I was on software-defined networks and... and and the like, and I said, look, if you knew what kind of data was gonna show up at a network, you wouldn't have to prepare your network to deal with it ahead of time. You could describe what properties it required for you to deliver it, like every packet had to arrive at the destination in sequence, or it didn't matter when they arrived, as long as they came within such and such a time, put them up on the screen, because the eye will resolve it. If you could describe what it was that had to happen, then the networks could interrogate these objects as they showed up and in real time decide how they would process it as long as you were you know, describing things that networks could do more generally, like don't deliver something if it's too late and things like that. Okay, we're in overtime here, folks. We, yeah, we were so. in overtime before we got started. <laughs> Oh my God! It keeps giving the, it keeps giving me more time. That's, I feel like because I'm, you're doing such a, a good job. So soccer match here. Oh, no, now, just see, now lost they, it. They yeah. cleared out. Do we have time for on. Sandeep? Do we have time for one more or an online or? Um, sure. Well, okay. there's a hand up. Yeah, this, there are two hands up over there. Oh yeah. Yeah. Great. Let's do one more. Or you guys just share the question. Yeah. This is <laughs> very very short. Uh, hi, Vince. Um, I want to talk about really the importance of the internet to the global economy. Mm -hmm. I don't think we talk about it enough. And if you think about what would it, the internet did for us during the pandemic, <laughs> without the internet, we would have been, you know, just lost. So I think when I, when I think about the internet today, and I think, um, I think about it as maybe one of the greatest technologies of the 21st century, and its contribution to society in general, I think, is being overlooked. And I wanted to get your impression of that. So um, do you want Vint to answer that, or can I, can I weigh in briefly here? Go ahead. Uh, in the latter part of the Clinton administration, it was reported that one-third of all the economic growth in the United States was somehow related to the Internet. Mm -hmm. I don't know how they came up with that number, but... Let's assume that there's some sense of truth in that. My guess is the same is true uh, in other countries. It may, may not be a third, it may only be 2% in some countries or zero in some that have no internet. But uh, the reality is that it offered capabilities you couldn't get before. You could now do business 720 by 24 around the world. You could deal with things that weren't that easy to do. Otherwise, you could be sharing things among multiple different parties. 
But to really do a, a, a careful analysis of that around the globe, I think, would be a good thing to do. I mean, I would encourage one to do it. And I have no idea what the answers would be, but I'll bet a big chunk of what goes on would be uh, greatly negatively affected if the internet weren't around. I mean, the, the, the test you'd want to make is shut down the internet and see what happens to the economy. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to do that test, but that would be the way to measure it. Mm -hmm. And my guess is it's going to be a very big chunk of it, but I would like to see that study done. I'm not sure who's best to do it, but somebody ought to do that. So uh, if I could just take one other uh, response to that question. Uh, the first thing I would observe is that uh, the, the uh, socioeconomic environment that we're in, and in fact the environment that we have always been in as a species and uh, in our civilizations involve the movement of knowledge, movement of information. And anything that makes information move more quickly and more reliably uh, is bound to improve the economy. And I think we're seeing the effect of that. We did learn to survive the pandemic of 1918 without the internet. So there's a worked example that we were capable of surviving mm -hmm. that without it. So when people say, you know, we couldn't have survived, I think that's probably not quite right. One thing we did learn uh, from the pandemic is that we have become very, very dependent on um, electronic information flows for the world economy and the supply chains began to fragment as a result of the inability of people to work together, so uh, physically work together. So internet certainly in, has provided us with some capacity that we would have missed if we weren't there. Uh, but I do worry that we are becoming extremely dependent on some of these online systems. If your mobile stops working, you might ask yourself, what is it that won't work for the rest of the day or the week? Right. And we're, we're pretty heavily dependent on that. And I'm nervous about the uh, you know, single mode failure problems that come up. So we should be thinking harder about how to make these systems a lot more resilient than they are today. So on a bright note, um, I'm, I have a couple birthday gifts. Oh my. And one, one is, uh, the first one is for Bob, and they each come with a little story. So years and years ago, when I was working on Wizards, I had dinner with you, Bob, and I think it was Len, it could have been Vin or somebody else, but you were definitely there. And, um, and you spent the entire dinner giving each other, it was you and this other person, maybe Patrice was there, and me, and the entire dinner was math puzzles. <laughs> <laughs> so, really? So, what? whoopsie. So, this is for you. <laughs> really? Happy. You Do you remember where that was? It was in the D.C. area. Really? And then Vint, so in May, Vint and I got together. He was doing a, um, an event for IEEE, and, um, and we had dinner the night before at this really nice, fancy restaurant at the top of the hotel in Atlanta. And yes. <laughs> and... The, and Vince said, and they brought, you know, the meal, and Vince said, I'd like some, you know, usually they assault you with the pepper grinder, and, but he said, we'd like some freshly ground pepper, and our server said, well, we don't have that. Ooh. And Vince, Minus five. And Vince <laughs> said, excuse me? And so she disappears. She comes back with clearly some kind of pepper grinder from the coffee shop downstairs. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so this is for you so that you never go without Oh, that's so sweet. Wow. Thank you very much, so, Katie. Happy birthday. Yes. <laughs> you can never have enough pepper. <laughs> and if I could say, Katie, thank you very much for doing a great well, job of Thank you. Things. That was amazing. Yeah, thank you, so, Katie. You guys, the, the podium's going to come back. You stay. Michael, first, thank you guys so much, and thank you, Katie. Um, and uh, um, Sandeep and I are sort of sharing this responsibility so here. Just to, to, yeah. So we have a couple of gifts for you also. Um, before that, I want to thank uh, Google Cloud and Google Global Networking for your partnership today, and also a shout out to the IP Foundation team. 
Google and our team worked seamlessly together uh, over the last six months, as Sandy mentioned, to make tonight possible. So thank you so much for all to all the folks who made tonight possible. It was a great, great event, and so thank you so much. Um, yeah, we have a couple of gifts as well for you. Um, this, is for this is for you, Bob. Wow. I got it. Can I hold something for you? I don't know. Shall I shall yeah. I open it? All right. Okay. <laughs> Holy cow. Wow. I don't know how I'm gonna get this on the plane, but <laughs> we have said it. You got it? Oh, wow, look at this. Lovely. Can I ask you then if you're gonna gonna do that? Yeah, You've got to find find a way to get your articles to have unique identifiers on them. <laughs> the publishing industry yes, as a whole would welcome absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's a, okay. It's a framed copy of um, Physics Today from October 1996, uh, special issue: 50 Years of Computing and Physicists. So, Good. thank you so yeah. much, Bob. Wow. Thank you. So we're not done with gifts. Uh, I have something for you, Vint. Uh, first, a few messages. Uh, first, on a personal note, it's uh, really been an honor to be working with you at AIP Foundation and doing this event. And I really admire your energy and curiosity. You know, yesterday I asked Vint, and he told me his near-term travel in the next few days. He's going to Glasgow, and then Japan, and then back to East Coast, and back somewhere else. And I'm like, how do you have so much gas in the tank? And he said, well, when I run my tank on gas, it recharges the battery. And so I have some energy left in the battery. So, uh, um, and also, Vint, I got a couple messages from a couple other people you might recognize. One of them is your manager, Vikash <laughs> well, Kohli. Uh, he mentioned that Vint is the reason I decided to pursue networking three decades back. He still inspires me every day, and he wishes you happy birthday. Thank you very much. And um, the other message we got is from Sundar Pichai. You guys very well know him probably as the CEO of Google and Alphabet. And his message was, we have a long-held philosophy at Google that you can be serious without a suit. <laughs> Vint, had, Vint and his penchant for three-piece suits proves the inverse can be true. <laughs> As one of the fathers of the internet, I count him among those who inspired me to pursue a career in technology. I feel fortunate that he has served at Google's chief internet evangelist for the last 18 years. True. And we continue to benefit from his deep expertise to ensure the web remains a positive force in people's lives. Glad to have the chance to help honor him tonight and wish him a very happy birthday. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. And lastly, we have something from the Google Platform's optics team that is very much involved in our data center networks. Uh, so they sent a gift, which is um, the MEMS die package. Oh, fantastic. You might recognize that. And so a little bit for folks who are not aware, uh, this is Google's in-house uh, technology, the optical control switch. Uh, this is called the Polymer. And this is used in Google's uh, worldwide data center network, and as well as in machine learning super parts. And if you look closely, you're going to see about, probably hard for you to see here, but from there, but there's 200 micro mirrors that redirect Google's internet traffic. And all of Google's mission critical data passes through optical switches like this and through these MEMS micro mirrors. Wow. So from the Google Optics team, happy birthday, Vint. Thank you very much. Wow. Mr. Photographer. No, you should get in on this. Here we go, yeah. So actually, let me see here. You know, I think I see a little problem over here in the upper left hand. <laughs> this is, this is
this really is an amazing technology. And you know, Bob's uh, company, CNRI, has been very much involved in microelectronic mechanical systems, MEMS, which is, uh, this is an example of that. So it's an amazing combination of uh, electromagnetic and, uh, you know, other physics forces that allow us to do things we couldn't possibly do otherwise. So thank you very much for that. So again, thank you. That's a perfect way with physics in hand in the middle yes, of the network perfect. and optics. And I actually, I sort of worked on parts of that 30 years ago for my PhD. So it's kind of interesting to finish with that. Thank you again for so much for joining us. I hope you got a little uh, view of the hi living history uh, conversation that we had with Katie and Vint and Bob this evening, which is actually part of our mission at AIP2 to promulgate the history of our of our science. So it's perfectly aligned with our mission. I hope you got a bit of a view into AIP and that if you support the physical sciences, you'll think of AIP as you begin to think about how you can partner to drive uh, advances in the STEM enterprise, which as we heard is so important to the future of humanity. So thank you very much for joining us this evening here at Chelsea and thanks to those of you who joined online and uh, safe home if you're traveling and enjoy the rest of your evening if you're at home. Thanks so much, Michael. I have, uh, if I may just have a minute, I just uh, want to also, if we could have a round of applause for our volunteers who work for oh, six yes. months. Thank you. Um, Abby Case, Anna Lee, Michelle, two dozen people. So thank you all. <laughs>